There are a lot of risky and daring adventures we expect from teenagers. However, killing people is definitely not one of them. It's surprising just how many young adults are convicted of serial killings. This does immeasurable amounts of damage to the victim's family and our society as a whole. And the fact that such a young man could be behind such heinous crimes is truly horrifying. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we'll dive into a teenager whose crimes resulted in the killing of multiple women across Canada. This is the case of Cody Legabrikov, Canada's teenage serial killer. Cody Legabakov is a Canadian citizen who was born on the 21st of January 1990 in the district municipality of Fort St. James in rural British Columbia. Friends and family members described him as a popular young guy who played ice hockey and showed no violent tendencies. Despite having a minor criminal record, Cody was not on the radar of local police. Cody resided in Lethbridge, Alberta for a short time after graduating from Fort St. James Secondary School before relocating to Prince George, British Columbia. He worked at a Ford dealership and shared an apartment with three close female friends. In his spare time, Cody used the handle One Country Boy on the Canadian social networking site Nexopia. He was a baby-faced high school athlete in Northern British Columbia from a large and loving family. Cody's grandfather, Roy Goodman, remarked, He had a good upbringing. Everything was beautiful. I went hunting with him. I went fishing with him. We took care of everything. And he was a completely normal child. He was just like you and me when we were younger. According to Ray Lemoyne, administrator of the school district, including the Fort St. James High School where Cody graduated in 2008, the six foot two man was a regular and popular kid who excelled at athletics. After graduation, he spent some time in Lethbridge before moving to Prince George to work as a mechanic. Mr. Lemoyne told the Prince George citizen, Cody has a loving family with caring parents, siblings, and a huge extended family in the region. At school, he was well liked by his classmates and he excelled in athletics. He was a downhill ski and snowboard team member and played minor hockey at all levels. Cody's good upbringing and background make it unbelievable that he could become a serial killer. How he descended to become one is still unfathomable. His grandfather stated, there's a split personality or something wrong in his head. He needs a doctor to help him. He was popular among his peers, and despite a birth injury that left him with permanent nerve damage in one of his arms, he excelled in athletics. He was a competitive junior hockey player and a member of his school's snowboarding team, and he was a self-proclaimed diehard Calgary Flames fan. And he loved the basic joys of a country boy's childhood, camping, shooting, and fishing with his family and friends. When Cody was arrested, friends began coming forward to defend him, the majority of whom asked not to be identified. Cody has always been in the wrong place at the wrong time. This could have just been one of those instances. Was written anonymously on the website of CPKG TV, Prince George's local news channel. He's a terrific friend of mine and I wouldn't hesitate for a second to jump in a car with him and go cruising. He was one of my two stepping partners on evenings when we would go out dancing. I've seen him in bar fights and I've pissed that boy off a few times, but he's never shown any signs of going insane and killing me or anyone else. All of this was taking place just a short distance from the infamous Highway of Tears, Highway 16, which extends 800 kilometers from Prince George to Prince Rupert. So many Aboriginal girls and women who have gone missing or have been killed were last seen alive close to or off this route. Officially, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in British Columbia are investigating 18 such deaths or disappearances. 
However, according to the RCMP, between 1980 and 2012, police across Canada recorded 1,181 occurrences of Aboriginal female killings and unsolved disappearances. Jill Stacy Stuchenko, a 35-year-old vocalist, was reported missing on the 22nd of October 2009. On the 26th of October 2009, her body was discovered partially buried in a gravel pit off Otway Road in Prince George. She'd been taken sexual advantage of and brutally murdered. Jill, 35, was also a mother of six children and when Canadians were enjoying their Thanksgiving dinner with family and friends, she was dead or dying, according to the judge. Stuchenko, his first victim, and two others, Montgomery and Mace, were also addicts who worked in the sex trade on occasion. At the time he executed this murder, he was Canada's youngest serial killer. The details of his second victim, Natasha Montgomery's death, were quite sketchy. Natasha Lynn Montgomery has been missing since the 31st of August 2010. On the 23rd of September, the mother of two was reported missing. Montgomery, who was 23 years old at the time of her disappearance, had recently been released from prison, where she had kept close photos of her two children. While her body was never found, her blood was found all over Cody's apartment and on an axe that was also discovered in his room. His third victim came a month after. Cynthia Frances Mace, 35, was reported missing by her worried friends on the 23rd of September 2010. Her body was discovered in L.C. Gun Park in Prince George on the 9th of October 2010. She'd been taken sexual advantage of and then beaten and stabbed. The authorities stated blunt force injuries to the head and piercing wounds to the chest caused her death. It was shortly after he committed the third murder, he was arrested. Leslie's lifeless but still warm body was located in the bushes just a short distance off the highway between Fort St. James and Vanderhoof, following recent tire tracks. She'd been taken advantage of and then viciously bludgeoned with a heavy object before being stabbed in the neck. She had her jaw and nose shattered, as well as defensive wounds on her hands. Her left hand also had swollen and broken fingers, which appeared to have been stomped on. Her pants were dragged all the way down to her ankles. After initially claiming he came upon Leslie's body while out exploring the area, Cody subsequently revealed to the authorities that he knew the girl and they planned to meet in person after speaking for a few weeks on a social networking website. Already preparing to see his grandfather and mother in Fort St. James, Cody said he drove his pickup truck to Vanderhoof, where he met Leslie at a school. He claimed they drank some of the alcohol he had purchased, had intercourse, and then drove to Fort St. James, where Leslie claimed to know some people. As they were in an interview room at the Vanderhoof RCMP detachment, Cody told a member of the RCMP's interview team that they decided to take a detour, have sex again, and go four-wheeling but that's when Leslie got crazy. According to him, Leslie began ranting about wanting to kill herself and how much she despised her mother. According to Cody, it then escalated to Leslie stabbing herself in the neck with a pipe wrench that had been resting on the floor of his truck. Cody said, I was like, what the heck are you doing? According to him, Leslie was quickly out of the truck and down in the snow with stab wounds to her neck. Cody claimed he was too surprised to administer first aid, but dragged her about 15 feet before returning to his truck and driving away. When notified she was found with her shoes, pants, and underwear off, Cody told another story and admitted to having sex with Leslie. On the 29th of November 2010, the situation reached a head when Cody's then-girlfriend, Amy Vole, showed up at the department. With Sergeant Paul Dadwell watching, 
The two shared a long embrace before Cody assured her that he did not murder Leslie. Cody continued to go through the story with a sad and sobbing vol, asking for forgiveness as well. At one time, Cody told her, I simply want you to believe me. An expert witness testified that blood from a woman who had been missing for nearly four years and is assumed dead was found throughout Cody's residence, including on an alleged murder weapon. As Jason Solinsky, who does DNA analysis at an RCMP forensics laboratory in Edmonton, led the court through the information he got from the various samples police collected from the scene, Natasha Lynn Montgomery's name was frequently brought up. Montgomery, who was just 23 at the time of her disappearance, has been missing since early September 2010, only weeks after being released from the Prince George Regional Correctional Center. According to Crown prosecutors, Cody is accused of killing Montgomery, two other women, and a teenage girl. According to Selinsky, more than 30 swabs of blood obtained from the kitchen, dining room, living room, and hallway were found to be Montgomery's. Blood found on a bedsheet, hoodie, and box spring mattress officers discovered in the apartment bedroom had similar degrees of certainty. Montgomery's blood was also discovered in nine swabs taken from an ax located in a linen cupboard, one on the edge and three on the head. Montgomery's DNA was determined by comparing a sample from a toothbrush she owned to samples provided by her parents. According to Selinsky, the odds of the DNA from the toothbrush being Montgomery's were 100 billion to one. That is a very strong, very strong link to me, Solinsky said. I am scientifically persuaded that this can be used as a reference sample. As the results were delivered, Cody's face remained expressionless, but his attitude showed that he was disturbed. Other evidence connected Cody to the other three people he is accused of murdering. Cynthia Francis Mace, 35, whose body was discovered at LC Gun Park on the 9th of October 2010, was identified by DNA taken from Cody's apartment after his arrest, as well as a sock found in his truck and the sweater he was wearing at the time of his arrest. Jill Stacy Stuchenko's blood was discovered on a couch taken from Cody's apartment. On the 20th of October 2009, her body was discovered in a gravel pit off Otway Road, about a year before Mass. Three witnesses who lived with Cody at the time of the discovery at a 1500 block Cannery Street residence identified the couch as his. One said she assisted him in loading it onto the back of his pickup truck when he moved it to the 1400th block Laird Apartment in April 2010. According to Cody's testimony at his trial, Jill Stuchenko's, Cynthia Mace, and Natasha Montgomery were allegedly murdered by others. The other men were identified as X, Y, and Z by Cody. He stated that he would not name them because he did not want to be labeled a rat if he was imprisoned. The 24-year-old admitted to the jury to having sex with Stuchenko at his residence. He stated that X told him she had to die and that he whacked her with a pipe to do so. Montgomery's death was also ordered by X, according to him. He testified that Z drew a weapon and then X shot and killed her. In his apartment, Cody witnessed X strike Mace. He informed the jury that X knocked her out by hitting her in the head with an object. He claims that he and Y then drove Mace to a park in his truck. According to Cody, he pushed open the door and dragged her out. She had just collapsed to the ground. He said she was still alive at that point. Cody stated he then got out of his vehicle and handed Y a pickaroon spiky log handling equipment. He testified before the jury that he heard Y strike her three or four times. 
I didn't feel good about what was going on or how I ended up in this situation. On the 11th of September 2014, Cody was found guilty of four charges of first degree murder. Cody was condemned to life in prison without the possibility of parole for a period of 25 years. Given the sexual crimes conducted as part of the killings and Cody's apparent degradation of the victim's corpses, British Columbia Supreme Court Justice Glenn Parrott added him to the National Sex Offenders Registry. He hasn't shown any sorrow or empathy. Detective Parrott said of the killer, he should never be permitted to return to our midst. Due to decisions against a change of venue and the defendant's legal representation, Cody filed an appeal in February 2015. All three judges in BC upheld the original judge's judgment. Court of Appeal case in September 2016. Cody was initially detained at the Kent Institution, but was transferred to the Workworth Institution in March 2019 to serve the rest of his life sentence. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Cody Legibrikov. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.